So what Heifetz would suggest is you've got to navigate this productive range of anxiety until you solve the problem. And that's called an adaptive challenge. Now the classic error is that we treat adaptive challenges as if they are technical problems. But in fact, adaptive challenges require new learning, new innovation, new ways of doing things. And I think this is where the difficulty comes. If it gets too hot, you introduce a technical problem. People like technical problems, even if they're quite complex. They can actually get their head around it. If it gets too cold, you've got to ramp it up. But one of the tragedies we find is that people are in too much of a hurry. You actually need time to be able to do this effectively. So what do we really think about the future? Uh -huh. I'm talking about this, uh, this idea of the trick of the slow brain. Um, Paul Norotrandis did this work where he says that our unconscious mind you know, works at 11 million bits of information every half second. And that dot there is our conscious mind. And we try to reduce a whole lot of good thoughts we may have into that little dot. That, you know, the, the real stuff that happens out there is in this unconscious mind. So when we're looking at learning... There are two ways of learning. One's learning from the past, and these are just some models put together. The first one is the unconscious incompetence to the unconscious competence model. I don't know who designed that, but it seems a very good one. But when you're getting down to you don't know you know, or your automatic thoughts, that creates your worldview. And Judah Beck sees the worldview as a cloud that's over your head the way you see the world, the way you see any situation. It's created by our, um, what's called our core schema, you know, nature's way of encoding what's good or wrong. Do we kill this person or do we be friendly to them? But it's also caused by what um, Helen Sidra Stone, the developers of voice dialogue, call our inner critics. <laughs> that is our inner voices. That we have inner voices talking to ourselves all the time. Now, some of you might be saying, come on, Rob, what are you on about? I'm the, I haven't got voices talking to me. It's those that are talking to you. <laughs> so I actually uh, trained to be a psychotherapist, and I found out that I've got 14 of these little voices. It started at a very young age. I was sent to a boys' boarding school when I was six years of age. And at six years of age, I didn't know that my parents thought that was a good idea. I thought I must have done something wrong or be dumb or something, that I had to be fixed up. So at your table, maybe you might like to talk about your little voices. When do they click in? What do they tell you? How do they operate for you? Just have a chat. Okay, thank you. So those little voices actually um, create, our, oops, create our automatic thoughts, first thing that comes into our minds, which creates our behaviours, our beliefs, etc. And what we normally do is feed them back into our worldview. So we have people who only read a certain type of newspaper, they won't read another type because of their political biases. You might belong to only your professional body and you don't see other professional bodies, the same church, etc. We actually try to make that bricks and mortar above our head even, even more solid. R.D. Lang, when he talks about depression, calls it the black cloud for depress people, that those voices are just operating all the time. So how do we go about um, working with this? Well, Ardris and Schoen came up with the, the idea that, um, of the double loop learning, that you know most of us want a result. To get a result, we do some sort of action. If we don't get that result, we come and do that action all over again. But this time we do it harder. So instead of going to work from 9 to 5, we find that we're going to work from 8 to 6, from 7 to 7. We take our work home. We have a whole lot of instruments with us that make it easy. He calls that zero, zero loop learning. The research would suggest that people spend about 80 to 90% of their time in action, not actually really learning. So you say, well, what else can we do about it? Well, of course, we can plan. Hopefully, you get a different sort of an action, get a different sort of result, and we come back and we do the planning all over again. 
and that's called single loop learning, as you know. And it's quite useful because it's about adaption and correction within the existing paradigm. It's a negative feedback, feedback loop. But its one problem is that it's within the existing paradigm. So innovation occurs within the existing paradigm, but creativity doesn't. So they suggest, well, what else can we do? And they're saying, well, we can slow down, ironically, in order to speed up, that we can be more reflective. Now, how many of you keep a reflective journal? Yeah, a few of you, good. Why do you think the majority of us don't keep a reflective journal? You've heard it before, that's probably the best life tool, if not business tool, you can ever have. Time, that's usually the excuse, yeah. The art, yes. Somebody else might pick it. Well, in the action learning concept, of course, it's a vital part uh, of what you do. The problem seems to be that you might not like what you're reflecting on. That it actually ca can cause anxiety. So I haven't got time. You know, all these other things come in. But if you can keep it going and make it a habit, it can be where also the new creativity comes out of and you have an opportunity of uh, changing or shifting your worldview to something that's more appropriate. So that's learning from the past. Incidentally, uh, according to Howard Gardner and uh, Sir Ken Robinson, a child up to the age of four or so can solve complex problems 97% of the time. They can get them right. By the time they're 8 to 13, that reduces to 50%, same level of complexity. And by the time you're 20, it reduces to 2%. It seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? But if you ask yourself, what is a young child always asking? Why? The why upon the why upon the why. And then it, Ken Robinson suggests we then start to batch them according to age or according to sex. We put them in school. And instead of inquiry that Bill Lucas was talking about, we have a curriculum. This is what you will learn. And if you're good at that bucket and bumper model, <laughs> you, will, you will do well. But a lot of our learning doesn't happen that way. So they would argue that most children, or probably all children, can learn anything if you can just find out how to teach them. So in your own learning environments, what is your feelings about that? Quite incredible, isn't it? That, uh, that we actually seem to dumb our kids down <laughs> rather than um, bring them up. Otto Sharma suggests that we, that we can also learn from the future as it emerges in the present. That we have this capability to become really present and to learn um, from ourselves as it is occurring now. And his idea is called Theory U. It's a U shape. And what he's suggesting is that when you're confronted with new information, you immediately down, start downloading at 11 million bits of information a second the answers. And what he's suggesting is that if you really ha can have an open mind, somehow you have to suspend those voices of judgment. He calls it I in me listening. All you're doing is listening to yourself. You might have experienced it when you're talking to someone, you're really not listening to them, you've already made up your answer to them before they're even finished. Dang. So the enemy of an open mind are these voices of judgment. So in order for you to see things through a different lens, somehow we've got to train ourselves to just suspend our judgments, our worldviews. views. 